good morning. It's great, uh, great to be with you this morning. My, uh, my wife and I are honored to worship with you. And uh, special thanks to the Oradolas and Rodriguez's for having us here. And I don't know where the Dimitris are, but uh, thank, thank you to them as well. Uh, also great to have Tim and Leanne here. You know, Tim and Leanne and I go back many, many years. Uh, I was just thinking about it actually when I was standing there. Uh, we've known each other for almost 20 years. And I remember uh, Tim and I standing in line to go share good news as young Christians. And both of us being scared out of our pants to have to go up and share and uh, consoling each other in line. But anyway, let's turn the Bibles if we can to Luke chapter 11. I heard you guys like the Bible here. So we're going to do a little Bible study this morning. And if you don't like the Bible, go ahead and listen anyway. And perhaps we'll change your mind. Amen? Luke 11 and verse 14, the Bible says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By bells above the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom dividing itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, very interesting. Jesus is going around at this time and going throughout Galilee and Judea, and he is performing miraculous signs. One of those being is he was casting out demons. Now, some have noticed that prior to the Gospels, there is little, if any, mention of demons. Some would say, why is that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. There are a lot of things that are demonic in nature that you and I have no idea are in fact demonic. Because we live in a earthly state, and so we see things from a humanistic point of view. But we understand that Jesus came from heaven, and therefore when he came down to earth, he knew exactly what was happening, as he was both in his earthly form, but still spiritual. There's no question that the demonic activity also ramped up as the Son of God came to earth. Anyhow, he's going around and, and very often demonic influence manifested itself in either what we would call mental illness or physical ailments. In this passage, this person is mute. They cannot speak. And the Bible says that Jesus goes and is able to cast out the demon and the proof of which was this man began to speak. You know, it's amazing about the miracles of the Bible is Jesus did miracles that could be confirmed. Very often today you'll see in different churches and on television someone healing knee pain or headaches or something psychosomatic that is unverifiable. But what Jesus did was so verifiable, the only excuse they could make is we see the power, but it must be of Satan. Jesus trying to explain himself goes, that doesn't even make any sense. Why would Satan attack himself? Why would he do that? Why would you do that? He goes, no. But if by fact I'm using the power of God, then you must admit the kingdom of God has come upon you. Well, he then now is going to explain through parable what exactly just happened. This will be the main text for our Bible study this morning. Amen? The Bible says in verse 21, When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, 
He takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left, and when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. The final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, the one in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's always tough to compliment Jesus, amen? <laughs> right here, we find something fascinating. Jesus says, hey, what happened when I healed that mute man was that you had a strong man guarding the house. When a strong man guards his house, his possessions are safe. We understand the strong man is a reference to Satan. The plunder or possessions of Satan are in fact the souls of mankind. And so what Jesus is saying here is what actually happened is one stronger than Satan has come. I have then tied him up, gone into his house, and taken back a possession of Satan. You know, they say that stealing things is wrong. And certainly, stealing, robbery, and thievery, in most cases, are bad. And yet, we read from this passage that as Christians, we are to be participants in the thievery of souls. You know, a number of years ago, there was a video game that came out that was very controversial. Now, mind you, I've never played it before. I stopped playing video games in 2001. I beat a game called Siphon Filter, and I retired. But this game, I heard about in the news, it was called Grand Theft Auto. If you're younger, you know it. If you're older, maybe not. But this was a game that the game was to go and steal from people. And of course, this was very distasteful as we don't want this to go into society. However, I've entitled my message this morning, not Grand Theft Auto, but Grand Theft Global. Amen? Turn your Bibles if you can, Ezekiel chapter 28. My first point for us this morning is to tie up Satan. You know, very interesting. We're going to read a little bit about Satan because if we are going to be a combatant of Satan and we are going to overcome him, we must understand a little bit about him. In Ezekiel 28, this is one of the few passages that is a descriptive of Satan. Very interestingly, though, it's not written to Satan, but rather to a king. Now, I think it'll become clear as we read it that it is, in fact, a Satan. But some have wondered, why would Ezekiel not write directly to Satan and address the king? Well, you see the same thing, actually, in the New Testament in the Gospels. A demon-possessed man runs and falls at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus bypasses the man and begins speaking to the entity that possessed him. Jesus said, what is your name? And the demon began to speak for the man, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So in this passage, we understand that Ezekiel is writing to the king, but he's actually addressing the one that was influencing the king, none other than Satan himself. In Ezekiel chapter 28, in verse 11, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tar and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in all beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. That already eliminates the king from being the God. Every precious stone adorns you, cornelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mounds were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. 
You were known as a guardian cherubim. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God and you walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways. From the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence, and so you sinned. So I drove you disgraced from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian of cherubim, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you're corrupted, your wisdom, because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. And I reduce you to ashes in the ground in the sight of all who were watching. And right here, we understand that this is not only a description of Satan, but of a battle in the cosmos that happened many years before Jesus came. Yeah. And the Bible describes Satan here as an angel, but more than that, a guardian angel. Who would better know how to assassinate a president than the one that was supposed to guard the president. The Bible goes on to say that he was adorned with beauty. He was made in a perfect image. You know, it's said that those of us that are attractive, which I would say is outside of me, I haven't quite gotten to enjoy this, but those that are more attractive get jobs five times quicker and five times better than those that are of lesser attractiveness. So if you're here today, you've been blessed with the pretty or handsome gene, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. But it is a gift. And the Bible says Satan was beautiful, attractive. He has been working for thousands upon thousands of years. What is his primary goal since being cast out of heaven? It is to ensure that you and I never make it there. Wow. And he has been perverting the gospel of God and stealing the souls of men from the beginning of mankind. You know, as I read just like this, it really fills my heart with discouragement and a little bit of helplessness if we don't consider the rest of the Gospels. Yeah. Because how could we, mere men and women, compete with such an incredible power? Yeah. Well, we already found out exactly how to do it in Luke chapter 11. Wow. It said that one more powerful than he has come. Yeah. And we know that that is in fact Jesus. Yeah. Look over if you can, Luke chapter nine. Sorry, Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter 9. We're going to read a story that I read uh, just a couple weeks back. And it really moved me. But in verse 14, the Bible says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher! I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. So, same situation we just read about. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus said to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often thrown him to fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I, I, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed and violently came out, 
the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus got indoors, the disciple asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it up? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. You know, I've uh, studied this passage for many years. And this past time, as I studied it out, something struck me. We understand that the disciples were being mocked because they were not able to do an incredible thing for God. You know, we have an incredible God, and God therefore expects incredible things for us. But at times where we are less than we should be, very often that leaves us to be mocked by the world. And that is the scene that he comes upon. Well, they were trying to cast out a demon of which they could not. Jesus then brings the boy to him, casts it out, as we all know. But then in private, he tells him something I think actually is a little misunderstood. He says, this kind can only come out through prayer. Now, what did I catch? Did you notice that Jesus did not pray the demon out? So Jesus didn't pray it out, though he told them they had to pray to get it out. Why? I do not believe he meant that in order to cast out the demon, they had to pray. I believe he was referring to their walks with God. You see, God had given them the power already to cast out demons. But you see, the power of God is only maintained through prayer. And as they had gone along their journey and doing the work of God and the will of God, somewhere along the way, They got so confident in themselves and their own abilities, powers, and strength that they veered away from the Word of God and from their times with God. You know, I look out at our audience this morning, and we have some incredible people here. I look out, and I've already met a number of people that are encouraging. Now, the gift of encouragement is awesome, isn't it? I love it. It's great. Someone who's encouraging just makes everyone else feel great and excited about what? Often we don't know why. It's fired up. Some of you have the gift of giving. God has given you great jobs and you're generous and you give that to bless other people. Some of you have the gift, as we talked about earlier, you're just good looking. That's awesome. I hope you encouraged yourself this morning when you woke up. But there are many gifts in the Bible that the Bible lays out, and God is a giver of gifts. He's also the giver of the Holy Spirit that you receive when you're baptized. And yet, if we do not maintain those gifts through maintaining our walk with God, those gifts can dissipate and soon disappear altogether. You know, most of you, well, some of you, know that I once was a basketball player. The only reason why most people still believe that is because of my height. But there was a day I used to play basketball. And I used to actually be a white guy that could jump. There's a movie that says that that's not true, but it was. I've won, I think, three different dunk contests in my life. Now, those of you who have played basketball with me as of recent, right now, you probably want to talk to me after about being dishonest. Because whatever was, is now become what once was. And sadly, is no more. I'm actually scared now to jump. As you get older, there's a fear not only of jumping and what that might do to your your leg, but the bigger fear actually is landing. (laughs) It's funny, on uh, Saturday mornings, I go to play basketball with a group of older gentlemen. And, uh, you know, we always start with a prayer. And in every prayer, without ceasing, without exception, Someone who prays, prays for health and no injury. Why? Because when you get older, that's the best you can hope for. And then you got guys like LeBron James, 
he's 38, and so Connor's going, well, if he can do it, why can't you do it? <laughs> well, it's actually pretty simple. I have not maintained what I once had. I lift weights, but not really anymore. I used to lift for two hours, now I do 20 minutes. <laughs> About three times a week, whether I get there or not, at least I think in my mind that I go that often. I don't like running. Do you guys like running? Running is awful. I get about a quarter mile and something starts talking to me in my head. You're not burning any calories. What, what are you doing? Just, just go back. And, and I'm very obedient. I go, oh, amen. Going back. I'm not what I once was. And I think that some of us can relate, yet not just physically, that is the story of your spirituality. And I know, I've gone through periods as a Christian where I've done great spiritually, and I've gone through periods where I've done so bad, there was even a time where I fell asleep spiritually. What does that mean, I fell away in the church? Why? What slowly happened to me is what happens to so many Christians. We slowly get confident and secure in our walk with God. Sometimes we get so busy in the work of God, we neglect our own relationship with God. And as we get further and further and further away from our source of strength and power, like the disciples who got up thinking they had the Holy Spirit and the power with them, went to fight the demons of that day and found out the power was gone. If we have any chance in our life to do something incredible for God, it will be not by our own strength or power, but by tying up that strong man, by tying up Satan, through prayer, and a whole lot of it with the power of God. I hope you're fired up about prayer this morning. Well, let's go if we can to Revelation chapter 12. My second point this morning is expect Satan to fight back. We're going to actually go to a, a text now that very often is preached and taught, and it, it, there is a possibility that it's accurate. But a lot of people actually preach this and mistake this, I believe, with the first casting out from heaven. I believe this is a different one entirely, but I'll, I'll share that with you. Amen. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. On, right. Bible says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars in her head. She's pregnant and cried out in pain as she's about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who's about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. He gave birth to a son, a male child, who ruled the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared by her God where she might be taken care of 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and the angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice from seven said, now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who have accused him before God night and day has been hurled down, for they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe the earth and the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you and he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. And right here, we understand that Revelation is written what's called apocalyptic literature. Meaning it is very symbolic in nature. 
This was a literature that was very common amongst the Jewish people, but it's foreign to us. So naturally, Revelation is probably the most misinterpreted book of all time. Amen. Usually people read it and they uh, attribute it to something happening right now in their life. But I think in this, we find something very interesting. We understand that this woman, the mother, is not the mother of God, as some say. At least not in the way they say it. She was the mother of Jesus. This represents the Jewish nation. Who then gives birth to the child. The child is Jesus. And waiting for that child to come out of the womb was the dragon, the devil. Have you ever thought about the devil and what he tried to do to Jesus and how mistaken he was in his strategy. I mean, think about it for a moment. The Bible says that the second Jesus came into the world, Satan tries to get him killed through the kicks. That doesn't work. Then later on, he tries to tempt him in the desert to win him over. That doesn't work. And then through Judas, who is incited to betray him, and the Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin, who are incited to kill him, Satan then puts Jesus to death. Now, mind you, Satan had read the Bible. He quotes it in the temptation. And yet what was veiled to Satan throughout all of Scripture was that without Jesus' death on the cross, you and I would not have salvation nor forgiveness of sins. And so Satan comes and he thinks that by putting Jesus to death, the hope for humanity is lost and gone. And yet we understand that the death of Jesus on the cross was not the loss of hope for humanity, but it was in fact the hope for all of you and I. The chance that through the blood of Jesus we could be forgiven of sins and of course one day be with God in heaven. The Bible says that when Jesus or when Satan figured out that Jesus was not dead, but he had resurrected and he ascended into heaven and was sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And the earth had become his footstool. He was infuriated. And the Bible says he goes up and tries to infiltrate heaven and through sheer force and power, remove the son of God. If you understand the timeline the way I do, this is the second time he's then cast out. Did you notice in the book of Job that Satan was still able to go up and down? I believe in this moment he is cast out of heaven for all time. No longer able to approach God. And that means his only place of residence is among you and me on earth. And the Bible says he's come back, but he's filled with fury. Because he knows his time is short. You know, I think very often as we go about working and doing the will of God, we go out and spend time sharing and evangelizing and getting with weak and injured disciples and strengthening them up. We think that everyone's going to be fired up about what we're doing and no one will ever say anything bad about you and no hardship will befall you. And yet that has not been your experience and it's not been mine. You see, a lot of us think that we're going to just go ahead and do the will of God. We're going to go and just waltz into Satan's house. We're going to waltz into his cabinets and just start taking soul after soul after soul out. And he's not going to do anything back to you. How ridiculous is that? Well, let's take a large brother. Who's the largest guy in this room? Anyone? Let's go with Mike. Let's say today that Matthew. Matthew was having a bad morning. Now, in this context, neither one of them are Christians. And he walks in and he he sees Mike. And he walks up to him and he just smacks him in the face. Would it be dumb for Matthew not to expect anything back from Mike? I mean, why don't you go up and hit big people to begin with? 
because you're smart enough to know if you hit a big guy or a big girl, she's probably going to hit you back. <laughs> and yet so often when we hit this larger than life figure named Satan, and he then hits us back, we're shocked. We're surprised. And we go, whoa, it's me. You know, I'll never forget growing up. I, uh, I was a basketball player, as I mentioned before, and now hopefully you'll believe me. But I was. And... It's not that I'm not loyal, but there was a sale, amen? Anyhow. Uh, growing up, my, uh, my father became kind of concerned about my lifestyle. Uh, for most of you, you probably know, if you've heard me preach before, that about 12 was kind of when all my sin began. Uh, I lived in a rural area called Hilo, Hawaii. And so there, there's not a whole lot of fun things to do. So you try to get inebriated and then do boring things to make them fun. So at 12, the first time was that I got drunk. First time I got high, I was 12. Uh, I got involved with girls at about 14 years old, and my life became Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The main objective was to get wildly drunk. Uh, I began selling drugs, doing drugs. Uh, it got so bad that growing up in Hilo, uh, because of the history, if you know the history of Hawaii, they're not very fond of white people. And uh, the, the, one of the phrases they use uh, was called haole. Uh, haole actually means without spirit nothing within them. And uh, of course, Hawaii has is, is, uh, changed a lot since I was young, and it's an awesome place. But, uh, but when I was young, a lot of kids would call me Howie and want to fight me for no reason. And my dad, he taught me never to fight. And after the first time I got beat up, I said, forget that. <laughs> well, I started fighting, and it got so bad, uh, and it was so frequent, uh, that there was a fight I got into where I knocked a guy out, broke his jaw, and they thought he was dead. I then got certified mail that was sent not to me, but to my father uh, and my mother at their residence. And my dad opened it up, which I think is illegal, but amen. He opened it up, and he called me, he goes, son. Now, my dad's a big guy, and he's not a smiley guy. He says, son, get home. We need to talk. I said, okay. I came home, I sat down with my dad, and he opened this letter. He goes, this is ridiculous. The letter said that even though I was a college athlete and a star player for the college team, I was not allowed to step on the premises of the dormitories for a whole year because of what I had done. He goes, son, this is ridiculous. You're drinking too much. You're partying too much. You're just, your behavior is terrible. Me and your mom are coming to games and you got black eyes and bruises. You need to change your life. I said, hey, amen. I left. And about a, a month later, with no relation to my conversation, uh, I became a Christian. Wow. Studied the Bible for the second time. And I radically changed my life. I stopped drinking. I stopped doing drugs. Stopped selling drugs. I moved out of the house with my girlfriend, broke it off with her. I mean, I radically changed my life. And I thought that because I was doing good, I felt good, I wasn't doing all these things, everyone would be fired up. About a month later, my dad sat me down again. He goes, son, come home, we need to speak. So I go home and he goes, son, I'm concerned. You're not drinking anymore? You're not going out anymore? You're not acting like someone your age. You keep going to that church. It's weird. I'm concerned for you. And honestly, I was taken aback. I was not prepared because I did not expect anyone to challenge this new way of life. I have since found persecution comes out of the oddest of places. And I think we've got to understand that our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities of power in our dark universe. And of course, we understand that that's Satan. You know, I got to ask you today, have you been shocked by the persecution 
that either the church has got or you've gotten? Are you taken aback because you've gone through hardship? Maybe you got baptized and you thought that because you were right with God that your checkbook would always be balanced. Maybe you thought that the lights when you drove would always be green for you. But all of a sudden you've gone through hardship. And get this, sometimes the hardship is because you're a Christian. And many of us are so shocked and surprised. I think even for some of us, we look at the persecution the church is getting, and we go, man, this church, we're we're just, we're blowing it. If we just toned it down a little bit, if we said things, I I mean, if I was in leadership and I was the person, man, I could do this without getting persecuted. Let me help you out. Our leadership team is filled with sinners. I'm a sinner. If you have any doubt about that, one day I'll tell you my life. I'm a major sinner. I'm a messed up person. But I'm forgiven and I've repented. Amen? Amen. So is the persecution towards me or Tim and Leanne or Kip and Elena, is it because we're messed up? Well, yes and no. If we were messed up and we're working at Jack in the Box and drinking and doing nothing with our lives, no one would care. It is because and solely because we have making a stand for the gospel and we're preachers of the word of God. That's why people are mad. And I say all that to say, I want you to join us. Join us in being thieves for Christ. And I guarantee you, you'll see more people saved than you've ever seen before. And with it, you'll have more hardship and persecution than you ever could have imagined. Let's go back to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 24. My third and final point is keep Satan tied up. Verse 24, the Bible says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to those to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. And right here, find out what happens spiritually when someone walks away from God. First and foremost, the Bible says that when someone gets right with God, spirits leave them. Now, for a lot of us, we associate demonic possession in the same ways that you see it in Hollywood. The head makes a 360, and we'd be crawling on the roof here. But that is not biblical. Did you know that that Judas was possessed when he betrayed Jesus? It says in John 13, Satan entered into him. That's possession. What happens when someone's possessed is that Satan gives them the power and the strength to go far beyond what they thought was possible. What I mean is this. When you get engaged in sin, in the initial phase, you're not possessed. Here's what everyone does when they start sinning. They decide to sin, but they limit themselves to a certain level of behavior and certain lines that they're not willing to cross. They say, I'll go that far, but no further than that. But in all of our experience, as we continue in that sin, it begins to build and to snowball. And soon enough, you're not on the left side of the line. You've crossed it. What does everyone say when they get restored? Or so often, what I hear from people, even something I myself said. I never thought I would go that far. You see, very often the problem is we think that we can control sin. Maybe you're here today and your thing is drinking. Maybe you've come today and you have a reputation among your friends that you're the master of drink. You can drink longer and harder. You know all the different sorts of ailments, the types. You can mix drinks and drink drinks and you can do everything imaginable with drinks. You might have come saying you're the master of drink. Maybe you've come today and you're amongst your friends the master of drugs. 
you do more drugs and harder drugs and longer drugs. And seemingly it doesn't affect you the way it affects other people. Remember now, you're in control. Maybe you've come and you are what the world would describe as a player. You think that people are in love with you and you're in love actually more with yourself, but we'll talk about that in a second. And you're all going, wow, I'm just, I'm the best. The women love me. Maybe you're a woman, the guys love me. I can get any guy, any girl that I want. I'm the master. My Bible would beg to disagree with you. My Bible says that you're not the master of anything. You don't master sin. Sin masters you. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20, you don't have to go there. You can set it out on your own. The way it describes the process of becoming a Christian, it's as if they have escaped the corruption of the world. Do you know how you escape the corruption of the world? The same way you do or someone does when they get out of jail. You ever seen a jailbreak movie where the person gets on the outside of the jail and they start jogging, crawling, or walking? No! They get out and they are gone! Because they know that it's their only chance. There are some who are here today who are studying the Bible. And this actually may be your only chance. After this, like so many others, you might be sucked back into the world. And though given time or opportunity, you may never get back to being as close as you are today to getting right with God. The problem is for some of us is, is we're not sprinting. We're not even walking in the right direction. And I want to challenge you. If I am describing you this morning, I want to encourage you. But more than that, I want to challenge you. You've got to escape. You are not and will not ever have the strength to fight against Satan without the power of Jesus and the word of God. If you have people in your life right now that are studying the Bible, that are trying to help you get right with God, stop delaying. Stop dilly-dallying. Get your life right with God. Escape the corruption of the world and send those spirits somewhere else. Well, the Bible says that when they come out, they go through arid places. But if they come back and find that your house is empty, they not only come back, but seven worse than the first. You know what happens when someone actually gets right with God and then falls away? The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, that you are worse off at the end than you were at the beginning. Now we know why. Because spirits come back and they come back by the truckload. And they get into your life, they influence you, and you are more powerless than ever to combat them. You know, I always describe repentance like cleaning out the house. Anyone here likes cleaning their house? Not a whole lot of men, but, but a few women, that's good. Do you guys ever notice the vacuum cleaner? I think the vacuum cleaner is possessed. It's, it's a bit of a joke, but you ever notice that when you get the vacuum cleaner, all these bad attitudes come into you? I'm the only one who cleans. I don't know what it is. Anyway. So, so we do have people who like clean. That's good. Who likes to clean the refrigerator? Anyone? Wow. You guys are dedicated. I got to be honest. I do like to clean to an extent. But going into the big, bad refrigerator, that's scary. I mean, you can go into the refrigerator, and if you look deep enough into the dark and beyond, you will find chemistry experiments. Now, if you're in a brother's household, it takes on a whole nother level. And there is nothing scarier than the moment in which you open up the refrigerator and you begin digging through and you see what's actually in there. You know, I don't know about you, but that is how I feel when I look into my own heart. And if someone is going to repent, they've got to look deep into their heart, and we have ugly things in there. The Bible says it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But we understand that the great power is through exposing it 
and renouncing it, we can have freedom. You know, I don't know where you're at today. Perhaps you've come here and you have made the decision once to make Jesus Lord. And maybe the first point that we talked about prayer, it hits you and you realize that you've not been prayerful and you need to become more prayerful because you want the power of God. I'm going to convince you through the next scripture and then I promise I'll sit down. That the issue of why you need to pray goes far beyond needing the power of God. Look over you can in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, we're going to pick it up in verse 15. This, of course, is a letter written to Christians. And he says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. You know, right here, the Bible says that we as Christians have two different paths we can choose. We can choose to be foolish with our faith, or we can be wise. And then he refers to the filling up. What you are then filled up with will determine whether you're wise or foolish. Do you know that you are a vessel to be filled up by God or by something entirely wicked and bad? We've I think, prove that here this morning. And the Bible says that it de depended upon your decisions, whether it be wise decisions or foolish decisions, you will then fill yourself up without even knowing what you're doing. And the Bible says here, rather than being filled up with the bath, it even goes on to mention being filled up with alcohol. I think I've mentioned that enough this morning. I think this is even a good admonition for some of us Christians who've chosen to drink. And there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol according to the Bible. But there is a wisdom you must have. Sometimes that wisdom is, hey, some Christians can drink socially and not get drunk, but I've tried it, I failed, and I'm not doing it anymore. I came to that determination over a year and a half ago. I said, you know what, I don't need this stuff in my life. I don't. I have a little bit, and I found myself actually drinking a little bit to cope with where I was at and what was going on. I said, this is replacing the spirit and prayer. I don't need this in my life. And you know what's been incredible? I don't miss the stuff. I can now not worry about being filled up or drinking too much or going further beyond what I should. I just go and read my Bible and pray, and I can get all I want of that. But it goes on. He says with songs, you should be filled with songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. He's talking about you coming together with the fellowship and spending time worshiping God. You know, right now in our fellowship, we're going through what we call Operation Solidification. It's code word for expect everyone to be disciples. Now, I do hope you know that you're in a church where we teach discipleship and we expect discipleship. Amen? But I think for some of us, we've given into a grave error of foolishness where we just don't think we need the body all that much. We don't. And you see it. I, I was talking to uh, Ole and Matt, and one of the things they mentioned as far as the congregation is there's a lot of people missing Wednesday nights. Yeah. Now, sometimes people get sick, amen. Sometimes things come up. But very often I've seen that that is a way of someone's life. You know what I tell everyone in the kind of the cost study? If you do not do this one thing, I have never seen a person stay faithful through the course of my discipleship who does not do this. You know what it is? Being devoted to church. I've never seen it. Maybe you have. I've not. I've never seen one single person who's lackadaisical and lackluster in their commitment to the body of Christ that makes it. 
They all, in short order, or sometimes some make it longer, they all wander off. I got to a point where I was doing so bad spiritually, and I was coming to church. But you know what decision I made? I said, no matter what, I'm not going to miss church. Although my heart might not be there today, I want to give myself an opportunity for that to change. And in my darkest days, spiritually, I missed one single service. I was not even part of the church anymore. I missed one midweek in six months as a non-member of the church because I knew that if I strayed further from the path, I would never make it back. And, and yet some of us are so confident and we have no idea that what you're actually being filled up with is the opposite of songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. You can set it out on your own, but there's a text in the Old Testament where an evil spirit was tormenting Saul. And he brings David in to play the music. And when that music sounds, the spirits leave. There is one place I know Satan is not this morning, and it's right here in the church. I thought I would close out this morning with a poem. Do you guys like poems? I, I asked Ole, but he, he didn't know. This is one of my favorite poems. It's called 10 Little Christians. And of course, it's a poem about stealing the souls of mankind. It says 10 little Christians standing in line Somebody's calling me. <laughs> Ten little Christians standing in line. One disliked the preacher, and then there were nine. Nine little Christians stayed up very late. One overslept Sundays, and then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven. One took the low road, and then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like chicks. But one disliked the music, and then there were six. <laughs> Six little Christians seemed very much alive. One lost his interest, and then there were five. Five little Christians pulling for heaven's shore. One stopped to rest, and then there were four. Four little Christians, each busy as a bee. One got his feelings hurt, and then there were three. Three little Christians knew not what to do. One joined the sporty crowd, and then there were two. Two little Christians, our rhyme is nearly done. Differed with each other, and then there was one. One little Christian can't do much, this is true. But he brought his friend to Bible study, and then there were two. Two earnest Christians, each one won one more. That doubled the number, and then there were four. Four sincere Christians worked early and late, each one another, and then there were eight. Eight splendid Christians, if they doubled as before, in just so many Sundays, we've had 1,024. In this little jingle, there is a lesson true. You either belong to the building or to the wrecking crew. Let's make a decision today to be thieves for Christ. Amen.